This is episode 44 of the Catholics Against Militarism podcast being recorded in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in Minnesota in the midst of Black Lives Matter protests, both peaceful and non-peaceful. We have people on social media putting up a blue square or a black square, depending on whether they're taking the side of the cops or the protesters. I see lots of posts on my social media about Martin Luther King talking about how he did not loot a single store or burn down a single church, and he he changed the landscape of our American society. I also see people posting about agent provocateurs, mysterious piles of bricks being placed in key locations around the country, wondering who put them there. Was it the white supremacists, or was it the George Soros-winged monkeys? Was it Antifa? We have Project Veritas coming out with an expose of Antifa and their aggressive, uh, violent training tactics. Some people are saying Black Lives Matter. Some people are saying All Lives Matter. Some people are claiming that only some Black Lives Matter because of the legal violence of abortion, which entails live human dismemberment and the selling of human tissue for profit. We have Black women being arrested outside of Planned Parenthood while looters are allowed to go free. We have Latino gangs fighting off Black looters in the south side of Chicago. In other cities, we have white guys standing arm to arm, side to side with Black guys carrying some kind of scary-looking AK-47s defending small businesses. We have curfews being instated around the country. We have the deployment of the National Guard. We have even calls to dismantle, abolish, or defend, defund the police. So I'm sure I'm not the only one who's feeling like chaos reigns. I think of Luke chapter 19, 42, when Jesus says, it says, As he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If this day you only knew what makes for peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The one thing that everyone seems to agree on is something that we talk about constantly on this podcast, which is, Violence is wrong, right? And yet, there's so, so much of it. So in this today's podcast, I thought it would be good at this time to run a podcast on Jesus and Gandhi. This is actually not an interview with Father McCarthy. It's a recording of a conversation that he had on Zoom with a small group of people who have been studying gospel nonviolence for a while now. Father McCarthy first explains Gandhi's inspiration for nonviolence. Jesus and Tolstoy, and a little bit about the times in which he lived. And then he talks about the problem that arises when we're looking at these two figures. He talks a lot about love and fear. And then he goes in about the biggest biggest differences between Gandhi and Jesus, which are extremely important. He ends on a controversial note. And then in the final 15 minutes or so, they have a question and answer session. So hopefully this will shed some light on a few things and be thought-provoking and helpful. Thanks so much for listening. God bless. I'll tell you what. Now, what about Gandhi here? Well, first of all, I think that Christianity owes a big, big debt to Gandhi. Because Gandhi... um, probably along with Martin Luther King in the United States, was probably the most uh, prolific uh, proclaimer on, uh, on a worldwide scale of nonviolence, indeed Christian nonviolence. He, uh, he absolutely positively based his nonviolence, without a doubt by his own writings, uh, on Jesus and his teachings. That's clear. <clears throat> in fact, he even said, If I could be a Christian just by living the Sermon on the Mount, which is the nonviolence, I would be a Christian, but no one will let me be a Christian on that basis. So by the very fact that he was, he was a a worldwide personality and he was absolutely committed to nonviolence in in the, uh, in the broad sense, he, uh, he therefore gave the idea of nonviolence, just the idea of nonviolence, an enormous amount of public awareness. And then the fact that he was using it against Christians, basically, uh, Anglicans and Catholics from uh, England. And they, in turn, were using 
were you were using uh, brutal violence against uh, against the Indian people. Few people realized that it was the British that first conducted aerial bombings. Winston Churchill ordered the aerial bombings by Charles Harris, who later turned out to be Charles Bomber Harris, who was the head of Bomber Command that that, that destroyed uh, Dresden and Cologne in the Second World War. But this time he was flying over India. It's about 1915, I believe, some, somewhere around there, 14, 12, something like that. And Churchill ordered him to release bombs on a recalcitrant Indian group someplace in India, and he did. And that's the first aerial bombing by a nation of another group in history. Be that as it may for this purpose, uh, Gandhi was working against a people that because we speak English and because we have kind of a simpatico based on language and other things with the British, he was talking nonviolence in the face of one of the most brutal people of the 20th century and one of the most brutal men of the 20th century, Winston Churchill. So it's not like he was just talking about this in theory. He, as he lived it, he was trying to figure out how to implement it. I think that's, that's always the case in history with, the, with gospel nonviolence is to figure out how you have to actually make choices in your time and space as it, as it is today. So, so he lived this nonviolent approach to the liberation of India based on his understanding of Jesus. And we always remember that his first introduction to nonviolence was through Quakers in England and then through one of them telling him about Tolstoy's Kingdom of God is Within You. That was the critical book. I once brought a person to Notre Dame to speak when I was teaching there in the program for nonviolence. His name was Amavai Chakravati. And uh, he is a professor of literature at SUNY University in, uh, in New York. And he was Indian. And um, he told me that for a number of years, when he was in India, while Gandhi was alive, Gandhi would give him, a, 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 Gandhi would send him to uh, Russia to place a rose on Tolstoy's grave on the anniversary of Tolstoy's death. That's the kind of respect uh, Gandhi had for Tolstoy. And the book, of course, was The Kingdom of God is Within You that Gandhi read, which is a masterpiece in terms of of gospel nonviolence. Maybe not other things, but gospel nonviolence. So, Gandhi, Gandhi, Gandhi's nonviolence comes from Jesus. He says that Jesus is the uh, example par excellence of nonviolence. So all this, all this portends well for studying Gandhi, because it, it, to be aware of what he said and, and so forth, and the Thomas Merton book, Gandhi on Nonviolence, is a, is, a reasonable, is a reasonable introduction. What the, what the problem arises in the fact that Gandhi also had within his mental or psychological domain a nationalistic political desire to free India from Britain. That did not exist. That nationalistic political desire to free India from the British, that did not exist in the psyche of Jesus in relationship to Israel. Jesus had no nationalistic political in the sense of, of, of uh, of state nation uh, desires to free Israel from Rome just wasn't there. In fact, he's quite clear his kingdom is not of this world. Someone just joined us, Peg, here. Yes, this is Pat. Pat. Hi, Pat. Pat. Kelly McCarthy. Hi, Charles. We're, we're, we're just in the middle of starting to talk about Gandhi. Verse, uh, uh, as a 
weighed against Jesus or in relationship to Jesus. So, okay, so, so Gandhi had very, very explicit, overt political desires for India. And he, he therefore, because of those desires were part of his, a major part of his uh, psychological and moral makeup, he had to free India. The nonviolence he came up with mimicked the nonviolence of Jesus, but unfortunately he placed a butt in it. But, and that but was, whereas Jesus teaches, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, turn the other cheek, you lose by the sword, dies by the sword. Where Jesus is, a to where there's a total rejection of violence, under all circumstances by Jesus, Gandhi's presentation was, if you can't live nonviolently, and get done what you think you should be doing in terms of getting Britain out of England or anything, then it is better to choose violence than to do nothing. And there is a huge, huge difference. Because anyone, except cra a crazy person, anyone who, who uh, says a word about justifying violence and war and so forth and so on, they don't mean that to be that you can just go out and whimsically kill people. They always have a reason for doing it, a reason that they think is quite valid. The Russians are coming or, or whatever the case may be. Huh? And Gandhi's reason for allowing people to choose violence and telling them that it was better, meaning morally better for them to choose violence than to do nothing, uh, was the liberation of the state of India. Now, he also tied that to the fact that to do nothing was cowardice. And cowardice was the giving into fear. And fear is the opposite of love. In the New Testament, fear is the opposite of love, period. Because <clears throat> there's quite a bit of difference between, there's a world of difference, an infinity of difference between saying, saying to someone wholeheartedly, I love you, uh, having someone say to you, I love you wholeheartedly out of their own understanding of truth in you as a person, etc., and having someone say to you, I love you because you're holding a gun at their head unless they say, I love you. The first is motivated by genuine love. The second is, is motivated by, by fear of being killed or hurt. And so Gandhi makes that exception. And in that, he parts company with Jesus because there is no exception. There is no exception in Jesus' teachings. Jesus is as clear as Gandhi is on fear. Fear drives out love, love drives out fear. The normal place for a Christian, I remember Dan Berrigan saying one time, the normal place for a Christian is to be an outlaw. And people People took that to me, oh, here he goes, talking about civil disobedience again. That, that, that's not what he was talking about. What he was saying was, the entire legal system is based on fear. It is rules backed up by the power of the state to hurt you. Uh, and if you don't follow those rules, you can be hurt. Hurt in a small way or, or a huge way. Um, if there are no if there are no sanctions backed up if there are no if there are no rule a rule not backed up by the power of the state to hurt you is a platitude it has no binding value in terms of the state it might have in terms of morality but not in terms of the state all laws 
all laws are rooted in fear, which means in the end, all laws are rooted in violence at a, at a, at a more superficial level. But the nature of violence, of course, is that in and of itself, what it does is it, it raises up fear within the person. The fear of being hurt, the fear of being killed, the fear of death, the fear of the family being killed, whatever the case may be. Right? So the crucifixion of Jesus was not just the destruction of a human being. It, it, was meant to, it, it was meant to place fear in the hearts of the Jewish people. This is what happened to you if you messed around in a way the Roman government didn't want you to mess around. Governments are run by fear from top to bottom. The chain of command is a chain of fear. I, I would suggest to you that a lot of other institutions are run that way. Uh, certainly any institution that has any kind of government status is run on fear. So, what Gandhi, what Gandhi set up as his primary value was not to fear. Not to fear. Better to kill than to fear. Better to use violence than to fear. That is not the teaching of Jesus. Wow. The teaching of Jesus is fear not. And then, and then, if you do fear, don't worry about that either, because God is Abba. God loves you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. And recognizing huh, that so much of what fear is, is just mammalian of the fact that we're animals, response to, to stimulus. The, the stimulus of what? Well, I remember seeing a, uh, a video on educational television years ago. And the video was that it was one of those science videos that examined a drop of swamp water, one drop. And what it could, what, what it could make clear to that was each level, that there were levels of, of size and shape and everything else of microbes in that one dot. And up to a point, it could visualize them. And what was clear was that in that drop of swamp water, there was a, feed, there was a food chain. The larger microbes were grabbing onto the smaller ones. But here's the part that was interesting. Every time a larger microbe grabbed onto a smaller one, the smaller one reacted, I'd say from a human perspective, with terror or with fear. It struggled instantly to get out, to get away. I often thought of that in terms of St. Paul saying the whole universe groans for salvation. And of course, we know if we look at any of the other documentaries, like with the larger animals, say some of the things of tigers and lions and so forth, and so the African jungle, not just the African jungle, but the, the, the level of fear and terror that floats through the animal world is, is quite visible. And so also we as mammals, we as mammals, also have those instincts in us. But the thing about the thing about Christianity, the thing about Jesus is that we can fail once, twice, 10,000 times, and God will forgive us in, 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 instantly and infinitely. We just have to say, I failed, I'm going to try to do better. Because we fail to do something doesn't mean we turn what we fail to do and do the opposite into good. Because I fear and I act in fear does not mean that does not mean that I should now say that it is all right to act in fear, whether that is to kill people or something else. So I know someone to give you another example. 
I know someone who is writing a doctorate in ethics in a Catholic university. And I was kind of going along with him over the years he was writing it. And he was pretty clear what, what he was saying. He was saying that, he was saying basically, nonviolence, nonviolent love is the way of Jesus. He had it pretty right. But anyway, it came time for him to defend his dissertation. And he had a board of three. And one of the members of the board of three told him that this is never going to get through unless you make some, some kind of adjustment in order to allow the Christian to, under extraordinary circumstances, to engage in violence and not have it be a denial of his faith. Well, anyway, the guy struggled with this for quite a long time, but finally he made the adjustment and he put the butt in his dissertation on Christian ethics. That's how difficult it is. When I talk about Jesus coming to vanquish fear, I think we can start right at the beginning of the first words out of the angel's mouth at the Annunciation, fear not. The first words out of Jesus' mouth when the, when the disciples are, are huddled together in a room in Jerusalem, terrified about Jews and Romans, and Jesus appears to them in fear not. The first words to the shepherds at Bethlehem, fear not. And of course, the explicit statement, love drives out fear, etc. Fear drives out love. But be that as it may, there is no question that Jesus knows the reality of fear in the human condition. There is no question he knows it's the opposite of love. But he also does not use one's weakness in terms of fear as an excuse to not follow him. In that most famous of um, pieces of literature, uh, something that William Manchester called a book that was written for the world, Andrei Sankowitz's uh, Corvatus. Now, Corvatus was a B-rated, terrible, terrible, terrible movie. But Corvatus, the book, got Sankowitz the Pulitzer Prize in literature. It's a different thing altogether. Well, in the book, Quo Varis, I don't know whether he does this in the movie, and I think he may do something like this. St. Peter visits the people in the, being held in the, um, in the prison in the Circus Maximus where Christians were executed. And uh, he visits them, and they're terrified, and they're terrified, absolutely terrified. And uh, d d people are in, in deep despair. A mother shouts out, you know, they, they, they took my two daughters and raped, her and then raped them and then killed them. A father yells out that, 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 that he has no children, they've killed them, they've killed them, you know? And, uh, and St. Peter's listening to all of this. And all the doubts in the mind, is it worth it? As, as, as Sankowitz points out, one person sits there all alone and, and the hair is risen on the back of his neck because he's thinking, suppose Caesar of Rome is correct and Jesus of Nazareth is wrong, what am I doing? What am I giving my life for? What have I done? Superb writing, superb presentation of what the problem of being a Christian is in a world that is saturated by evil and people willing to use evil to hurt others and produce fear. And so, in the particular story, what takes place is that St. Peter hears all this, you know, in the prison and the people are going to their deaths so they can hear the, the lions and the crowd screeching and yelling and crazy stuff, you know? Well, anyway, 
Finally, he starts talking to the people who are about to go to their deaths. And he, say, and he says, the opening words are, brothers and sisters, you have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear. Mother who lost your two daughters and who, who daughters were deflowered by the Romans, this day you will be with your daughters in paradise with the Lord and they'll be like the lilies of the field, beautiful, innocent, totally repaired and full of joy. Father, you who lost your son, etc. he goes through the same thing, that we're dying into life. We're not dying into death. And so they make the choice to go into the Colosseum and die. When Berrigan said, the normal place for a Christian is to be an outlaw, knowing that laws are all backed up by fear, what he's talking about is, not that we don't fear, but we have a will, a free will. It can be hampered, it can be interfered with, it can be undermined even. But if we fear, the idea is that is not a sin. That is not evil, fear. If we fear and go forward in love, all the better the act of love. Anyone that's sweating blood an actual thing that can happen out of high anxiety in the Garden of Gethsemane is not looking forward to being executed, tortured, suffocating, whipped, on a, and, uh, and, and hung to die naked on a, on a cross. Jesus is fearing, but your will be done, not mine. Now, suppose the will is not done. Suppose I fear and I can't overcome it, and I don't love the person. Suppose I fear so much that I kill him. I can't, that I, I am, Jesus does not say that that's acceptable morality. Jesus says, repent and keep going on my way. That's the difference. That's a huge, huge difference. And so, in St. Teresa Lizier's story of a soul, there is a, uh, a, 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 or maybe it's in the book of, or the biography of a life uh, called The Story of a Life by the, by the Bishop of uh, Lizier. Of, but anyway, the story is told to St. Teresa, garnered from her sister's writings and St. Teresa's writings, I guess, how on one occasion she, um, in the very, odd atmosphere in which she lived as a cloistered Carmelite nun in the last part of the 19th century in France and all that men. She tells a story of one time when after she was a nun, somehow everything kind of come in, came in on her. In fact, now I'm thinking of it, she tells the story. Everything kind of fell in on her mentally and so forth and so on and she was, and she was fixing the refectory for dinner, putting the plates out and everything. And she took one of the plates and she dashed it down and broke it. And she, she instantly had great regrets and she knew she did the wrong thing and, and so forth and so on. But what she says in the book, she says, what I learned from that is I need God to do what I'm supposed to do. I can't do it alone. It was, it was what was taught to me that I should be more humble about my own abilities. It was an exercise that what, what she got out of it was, yes, she failed. And yes, she was sorry for it. Yes, she would try not to do it again, but she wasn't going to do it alone without God. Now that brings us to another point in terms of Gandhi and Jesus. 
And that point is this, that the failure was God's way of God's grace telling her. That is the failure where she repented and saw the failure and didn't just carry on and say it was good. Huh? Remembering when, you know, I think you've probably heard the story when, when St. Basil, the founder of monasticism 150 years before Benedict in the West, and he's, when he was asked what the difference was between a good monk and a bad monk, his, his answer was, a good monk falls and gets up, falls and gets up, falls and gets up, falls and gets up, falls and gets up. A bad monk falls and calls it good. Well, St. Teresa didn't do that. She did, she, she, she knows, she knew she did something that was not Christ-like, uh, remembering that she specifically says the guide of her life is a new commandment. And therefore, she feels terrible about it, but she recognizes it's God's way of telling her she needs him and to stay humble and not think she's doing everything by herself. Keep, keep in the presence of him, keep in his grace, keep working, keep working at that, that relationship because that's what is important in terms of living the Christ-like life. Okay. The one of the big differences between Gandhi and Jesus, maybe the biggest difference, huh, is that Christ is risen and Gandhi isn't. Now, this is not a way of putting down Gandhi, no more than it would be a way of putting down, of, 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 of putting down Dorothy Day to say Christ is risen, but Dorothy Day isn't. This is a way of communicating that in the history, is that in reality, and in the history of the salvation of human beings from this entrapment in evil in which we are caught, there is this rather unique person and event called the Jesus event that loosely speaking begins in Bethlehem and ends on Easter Sunday. And the Easter Sunday part of the event is not in anyone else's history. And the event is communicated that the reason for it is not just to verify or validate what Jesus taught. God wouldn't raise someone from the dead to validate uh, untruth. The reason for it is stated in the, in, the, uh, in the Christmas narratives, the birth narratives. It's in not Jesus being given the name Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus rises to be with us. We do everything. Our thoughts, our words, and deeds, not only an imitation of Jesus, but with Jesus. That begins at baptism, when we are baptized into Christ. By God, we are adopted into the very person of Jesus. And he's closer, as St. Paul says, to us than breath. And therefore, staying conscious of that relationship, living out of that relationship, living through that relationship, living with that relationship, there is where the grace of God is given to do the things that Jesus would do. Indeed, to even understand what is happening in a way that we would not otherwise understand what is happening. So I, I would say that that last point that I made, that Christ is risen, but Gandhi isn't. This is not to, this is not to downgrade Gandhi spiritually. It is, of course, to make a point that metaphysically he's something different, not spiritually. Gandhi says, I believe it's on page 17 of his autobiography. All that I do in the way of politics, in the way of writing, in the way of service, I do, and here's the words, Gandhi, I do ultimately 
in order to see God face to face. See God face to face. That's what all his life is about. And I would suggest that everyone who's interested, who talks about Gandhian nonviolent strategy, Gandhi in this, Gandhi in that, Gandhi in tactics, not overlook this. Because this is a man who has a teleological outlook on individual life and human life. That is the end he sees. He sees doing things in terms of an end. So he and others can see God face to face. He is a, he is, that, that's exactly the kind of thing that Jesus was doing in the gospel on his day in, day out basis. Showing people the way to see God face to face, the way of eternal life. How to see God face to face. So, it's not that Gandhi is a bad man, it's not that he's evil, it, but he is in a metaphysically different position. Sometimes a better word is, a word that, that, that's often used in the Eastern churches in place of metaphysically, he's mystically in a different position. Mystically just being the Greek word for hidden. In a hidden way, Jesus risen from the dead is available to us, with us, in us, in a way that Gandhi is not, and there to help us. Most especially, and I'll stop with this, most especially, I would say, most especially, Jesus is there to be with us, help us, serve us, help us to become what we are, him. Uh, I think it was St. Augustine who said, who said uh, at the reception of communion, the attitude is to be, the attitude that, that the communicant is to come forward with is to receive what you are and become what you receive. Therefore, therefore, the place I believe that Jesus is most with us, most can efficaciously affect us if we once again, it's our will to choose it or not to choose it. it it's in the Eucharist, the agape meal. It's, that's what we have. And so I'll just end on this, which, uh, which is a controversial note, but it does have an imprimatur on it. I, I think it can be found in John L. McKenzie's Power and Wisdom, his interpretation of the, of the New Testament, 1966. He says, only a Christian can engage in Christ-like love. He doesn't say only a, only a Christian can imitate Christ. He said, only a Christian can engage in Christ-like love. And what he's talking about is this. We are not Pelagians thinking we can do it all ourselves. We, we are given the gift of faith, and that faith includes not only a way to eternal life, a way of doing God's will, but includes infinite help in the person of Jesus, God with us, to do that will. Only a Christian, only someone who believes that Jesus exists right now, that has the authority and the power to help, only a Christian says to Jesus, help me. Because only a Christian believes Jesus is risen from the dead. And therefore, it would be absurd to say to someone you think was gone, removed, annihilated, or in some domain that couldn't be reached, say, help me. But the very nature of Christianity from the beginning is, Jesus is there, and he can be spoken to. He is there to help. He is there to respond. He is there to empower. He is the source of the grace. That is, grace simply being the life of God that puts the power of God in us so that our thoughts, our words, and our deeds have something of the life of God in them. We can try on our own and we can imitate. But 
only, only the Christian would say, would pray to Jesus to help him do this. So I'll stop there as, as far as talking about uh, the similarities and the difference and so forth between Jesus and Gandhi. And uh, if anyone has some thoughts, just doesn't have to be questions, just thoughts, ideas. To, that's what we're here for. Well, I would like to uh, uh, mention something. I have a lifelong friend who uh, <clears throat> is now a retired priest, but before he was ordained, he was actually married. And before he was married, he was uh, in the Navy <clears throat> and he's my age. So all this was going on around that time at the Vietnam War. He was in the Navy. Uh, he never uh, was shipped overseas, but at some point in the Navy, he discerned that he was a conscientious objector. So he used the channels that were existed in the Navy in order to be released from his military duty. So he is a conscientious objector like I am. Mine was, I, did, I didn't join the military. I didn't want to take the step in the direction of violence at right, all. Right, gotcha, gotcha. So, uh, so he's, he functioned as a Catholic priest for probably 25 years in a parish. He was a pastor and so on and so forth. And he spoke about uh, pa uh, pacifism. He spoke about conscience subjection. But when, when we speak about it, um, he always, um, lately he's, his, his, his stance is, well, you know, the church uh, says that conscience subjection is acceptable, uh, but uh, they also uh, say that uh, cooperating with the military or uh, being in a in a organization that uses deadly force that those are acceptable also. Uh, and he he got he uh, directed me to Gaudium at Spes uh, and, and mostly in paragraph uh, seventy nine. And Gaudium and Spes is is the churches, the churches teaching at this point on those two issues, participation in uh, government uh, organizations that protect people and uh, conscience subjection. So uh, this is kind of an impasse for us in dialogue, and I don't know if you've run into this, uh, Charlie, in in your. Uh, dialogues with others, but uh, I'd be interested in what you might have to say about that. Uh, not as an answer, but just, just what well, well, Mike, I run into it, have run into it, oh, 12 million times in my 50 years of doing this. At least 12 million times. <laughs> the church says, the church says. And so we have to ask, first of all, does the church say this, that is, that you can go, the church says you can go to war, let's say, justified. Does the church say you can do this, does, he, does it say that dogmatically, infallibly, any place? And the answer is absolutely not. It is not dogma. It is, an, it is what is called a tolerable opinion. Technically called a tolerable opinion. Now, the question becomes, every individual Christian has to stand with his understanding of Jesus. When we, we, as the joke goes, when we go to the pearly gates, we can't, we, we, our, an excuse is not going to be, well, he told me so. No, you have right in front of you, you have as many of the fundamental doc, doc, documents of Christianity. In fact, you have the fundamental doc, doc, document of Christianity there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And in sections 18 and 19, of the dogmatic, dogmatic now, not doctrinal, dogmatic constitution 
on revelation in Vatican II. There's only two dogmatic constitutions, and this is one of them. It says that the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it names them, contains all that is necessary for salvation. All that's necessary for salvation. Secondly, it says, where there is discrepancy between the Old Testament and New Testament, for the Christian, the New Testament takes precedence. And this is the part I'm getting at. It says, where there is any discrepancy between the New Testament, between the, the rest of the New Testament and the Gospels, the Gospels take precedent. Why? And it says, because the Gospels have always been given a special preeminence in the church, um, over and above everything else. Now, this is, in the Byzantine Eastern churches, Catholic and Orthodox, the book that is on the altar is not the, is not the Bible, it's the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There is no Eucharistic adoration in the Eastern churches. The equivalent in the consciousness and the mindset of the people is adoration before the gospel book. The gospel book is more than words. It's the living presence as close as we can get to Jesus. It's the living presence of the word of God, not just the words of God. And therefore, when Christians go to confession in the Eastern Church is Catholic or Orthodox, it's not the confessional box, uh, they, they, they stand in front of the icon to the right of the iconostasis, uh, which is either Jesus with the book closed or the book open, whether he's Christ the teacher or, or, or Christ merciful, and they make their confession holding the gospel book. This is the standard. This is the standard by which they have to, have to communicate with God about what their life is, what they want it to be, what it hasn't been, what it should be. The four Gospels. Going a step further with this, what is, what is at stake is huh, that in the in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in section 9, 1970, it says that the entire moral law of the gospel, the entire moral law of the gospel is contained in Jesus' new commandment to love one another as I have loved you. There is one place and one place only where we are going to ultimately discern for ourselves what it means to love as Jesus loved. And that's in the four gospels. That's the ultimate. We may have other helps, but that's where we've got to go back to test everything we get from every place else. In section 2822 of the New Catechism, it says, it's the section that deals with the Our Father, the section where it says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It says, the, the entire will of God that is to be done in, on earth as it is done in heaven is contained in the new commandment, love one another as I have loved you. Now, you and I have been brought up in an utterly different understanding of all kinds of things from that. I'd never heard of that till after, after 21 years of Catholic education, all the way to a doctorate. Never, and it was never taught. And why this is important, Michael, is, therefore, anything that I say, anything that you say to yourself or to others, Anything that anyone in the church says, whether it's the Pope or a Cardinal or a theologian, ultimately has to be measured against the person and the message of Jesus. 
as it is presented in the four Gospels, not as it's given by some revelation to some guy in the 6th or 14th century. The only exception to that is if there is an infallible dogmatic presentation that this is in fact consistent with the four Gospels. Other than that, the individual person has to make his or her decision. Is this logically consistent with what is written right down there in place right down there with the living gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because if it's not, it doesn't make any difference what people have an opinion of in the church. If it's not dogma, it's opinion. And if it's opinion, that leaves open the fact that it can be wrong. And since it can be wrong, the person has to make the judgment whether it is wrong. Is it, in fact, not consistent or consistent with the will of God as revealed by Jesus in the Gospels. When, when, they, when the disciples are all leaving Jesus, and the apostles, not disciples, leaving Jesus, and Jesus, and Jesus says to the 12 apostles, are you going to leave too? And Peter answers, where will we go, Lord? You have the words to eternal life. This is not about philosophy. This is not about, this is about not Jesus as a philosopher, as George W. Bush called him. This is about someone who either does or doesn't reveal the will of God because he knows it. Therefore, therefore, no human authority no human authority who says it's my opinion can override the teachings of Jesus. And anyone that listens to a human authority has to say to, to, to themselves and, and before God, is this consistent with the teaching of Jesus? So after, after the infallibility decree, this is so, so critical to the Christian life. After the infallibility decree in 1870, I think it was, uh, which Cardinal Newman, St. Cardinal Newman now, opposed, opposed. And so after, he was at a banquet, you know, and uh, people asked him to make a toast. And so here's the toast, famous toast. He says, he says, he raises the glass and he says, to the Pope, but to conscience first. Conscience is my looking, deciding what is true in terms of the teaching of Jesus and then following it. Or as Dorothy Day has, uh, used to, you know, said, if you follow a saint in what they do that is not Christ-like, you go to hell. Now, that's just a hyperbole I know that she was using. She was just trying to make the point. It's not the saint. It's not, it, it, it's, it's not the cardinal. It's not the theologian. It's not the catechist. It's, it's not anything else. What is at stake here is that Jesus is revealing the will of God that you were created to live in the four Gospels is the ultimate discerner of that, presentation of that, is what someone else telling you regardless of his status or lack of status in the church, consistent with that. If it isn't, so to put your question the way I tend to get it is, is gospel nonviolence, is that an option or an obligation for Christians? And I ask, I say, it's an obligation that comes with being a Christian with baptism. But I'll also say, if it is an option, show me in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John where Jesus makes it an option. It's not there. And everyone knows that. Every justification of violence in the Christian life comes from philosophy, 
not from anything Jesus said. Very good. We're getting, Thank you. We're getting close to the end of the next half hour. Do you want me to set up another or do, or are people needing to get move on? To... I don't care. Whatever you want. I'll, uh, maybe people feel a little, you know, they've been a lot while here. Maybe we set up for another day or something. Yeah. Know? Yeah, another day would be great. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that, Peg. Okay. You, know, you get together, you guys, you pick another day and I'll be here. Okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I definitely want to hear more about loving like Christ can only be done by a Christian. Because we, when, you know, in today's world, you know, you see Muslim people being very um, loving and um, self-sacrificing and um, you know, maybe they're living with Christ-like love, but not, but you might call that imitating. I, I understand what you're saying. I, I mean, I feel like we should read Power and the Wisdom again because of how Mackenzie puts the, the Christ event as central imperative. That's, that's everything. It's, it's, it's all around. Yeah, I, just to tell you about John, you know, he, 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 he said, he said, the people are forever ever accusing me of being Christocentric. I am. <laughs> yes. And, and by the way, nothing that I said in that, and that's a good thing to talk about next time if you want, but nothing that I said has any implication whatsoever of Jews, Muslims, Shintos, atheists not being saved. The, the statement is only Christians can love as Christ loved. Because we're united. Into because of that united thing and that openness of the will to make the request to help you. To help. Just a quick anecdote. Uh, when uh, when uh, I used to go to Shalom House for uh, clarification of thought, Catholic worker idea, uh, there was a Baptist minister who used to come and, uh, and participate in that. And one time he said that, uh, it, this wasn't his own idea, but he said that, uh, Gandhi was like the story in the gospel of the two sons. One of them said to his father, yes, I'll do what you told me, and then he didn't do it. And the other one said, I won't do what you, what you told me, but, I, but he did it. So Gandhi was like the second son. <laughs> I thought that was an interesting insight. Well, I'll, I'll tell you another one, if, just to just take a minute if we got the time. Uh, one, Lando Del Vasto, who was given the name Shantidas, Servant of Peace by Gandhi, who had a couple of doctorates and about 36 years old, he came to the conclusion after all the study and learning and philosophy and physics, he didn't know why a fly existed. And he went to India to live with Gandhi for a couple of years because he saw that Gandhi was, there was something about what Gandhi was doing that was universally right. And he went there and he wanted to stay in India and stay with Gandhi and Gandhi said, no, you are, you're a Westerner. You know the West. You know how the West thinks. Where go back to your people and talk about nonviolence. Proclaim it. So anyway, years ago, 1979. I don't know if you were there, Peg, or not. We had a, we had a. I brought Lonzo Del Vasto here to the United States to give a conference to people uh, uh, at a Baptist camp who never would get to hear him normally. Real cheap. And anyway, he gave his talks and everything. Really good really good um the the trappist monks up at spencer trappist monastery in massachusetts here asked me if uh, asked me if shandy das could come there and give a talk to them so we worked it out and i drove him up there and he gave his talk now after the talk on nonviolence, gospel nonviolence, etc etc excellent you know um i was waiting with a little, they were going to give a cup of tea and stuff. I was waiting there with a priest, a Trappist monk by the name of Theophane. And uh, Theophane, <clears throat> Theophane, who was a good friend of mine, Theophane said to Shanti Das, he said, um, he said, Shanti Das, why do you keep saying that, uh, that Jesus is the way? Jesus is the way. He said, he said, I've just come off a 40 day Buddhist retreat. He said, and, and, and you're away, and Gandhi's away, and Dorothy Day's away that we can follow. Why do you keep saying Jesus is the way? And he says, 
because Jesus says, I am the way, not a way. <laughs> Sounds clever. But then he went on to say, look, he said, I know what you're saying. You're saying the sun shines on, on, on a lake that all human beings see. And in that lake, every once in a while, there's a big sparkle made by the sun, you know? That's Buddha. Uh, that's Gandhi, that's Moses, that's Dorothy Day, that's Mother Teresa. These big sparkles come up. And yes, we can say Jesus is one of the sparkles of the lake. We can say he's even the biggest sparkle on the lake. But Jesus is also the sun. And that's the difference. That's why he's away. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of, of metaphor to, 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 to think about in terms of Christ is risen in the Trinity. So, we'll just pick another time. Is that what you want to do, Peg? People, yeah. I don't know. And, and we'll, Peg will let me know and I'll be here. I'll, I'll be here and it's good to see you. It's good to be with you. And Yes, thank you so much. This is no great. No problem. Um, Just glad to be here. Glad to be here. Very, very good. This good is great. Thank you. See ya. Okay. Bye now. Bye.